Welcome to another episode of Esoteric Atlanta. As always, this is just a reading from the Book of Jubilee, which we are now discussing on Tuesday nights on the Dark Outpost. If you would like to join us on Tuesday nights to hear more commentary and more of a breakdown of all of these missing books of the Bible, then please follow the link down below. Once again, a very special thank you to all of our patrons who help keep this channel going. We greatly appreciate you. Without you, we would not have a channel. If you would like to join our Patreon program, there is a link down in the description box below. Today we're going to be starting with chapter 4 in the book of Jubilee. This is part 2, so if you did miss part 1, a link to that video will also be down in the description box below. There will also be a link to all of the banned books of the Bible that we have covered on the Dark Outpost down in the description box below. Okay, let's get started with chapter 4. And in the third week, in the second jubilee, she gave birth to Cain. And in the fourth, she gave birth to Abel. And in the fifth, she gave birth to a daughter, a one. And in the second year of the third jubilee, Cain slew Abel because God accepted the sacrifice of Abel and did not accept the offering of Cain. And he slew him in a field, and his blood cried from the ground to heaven, complaining because he had slain him. And the Lord reproved Cain because of Abel, because he had slain him, and he had made him a fugitive on the earth because of the blood of his brother, and he cursed him upon the earth. And on this account it is written on the heavenly tables, Cursed is he who smite his neighbor treacherously, and let all who have seen and heard it say, So be it. And the man who hath seen it and not declared it, let him be accursed as the other. And for this reason, we announce when we came before the Lord, our God, all the sin which is committed in heaven and on earth and in light and in darkness everywhere. And Adam and his wife mourned for Abel four weeks of years. And in the fourth year of the fifth week, they became joyful. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare him a son and called his name Seth. For he said, God hath raised up a second seed unto us on this earth instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. So again, we are jumping into the Old Testament with these missing or banned or heretical books of the Bible into the book of Jubilees because for those who have been following along, you know that in the New Testament Gospels that were, were missing, we stumbled upon the Sethian theology and the Apocryphon of John. And for myself, and I know for many people watching who grew up in like a Christian, a modern day Christian home, we were not familiar with this Sethian theology. This is why we are going back and looking at the book of Jubilees to have a deeper understanding of the Sethian theology. Again, this was a theology that would have been understood by the early Christians and part of the Jewish culture as well, because it is a part of Jewish mysticism. And obviously the Jewish heritage and faith is the foundation of the Christian faith. So it's really important for us to understand this. And of course, the Sethian theology does come from Seth, the son of Adam and Eve, after Abel was killed by Cain. We know that Cain's descendants go on to become Canaanites. Um, a lot of them were eradicated from the earth during the flood. And Seth, Seth, excuse me, Seth's descendants are us. They become the other people, the soon to be what, what Jesus called Israelites. So we're going to continue with verse 8. And in the sixth week, he beget his daughter Azura. And Cain took Awan, his sister, to be his wife, and she bare him Enoch at the close of the fourth jubilee. So very important for me to mention here, we're going to see two Enochs. So the Enoch that is Cain's son, the grandson of Adam and Eve, is not the Enoch that we're going to see later on in this chapter that goes along with the book of Enoch that comes from Seth's line. Okay, same name, different lines. I think we can understand that today in our society. We have people with the same names who are very different in character. So once again, starting with verse 9, and came... And Cain took Awan, his sister, to be his wife, and she bare him Enoch. 
at the close of the fourth jubilee. And in the first year of the first week of the fifth jubilee, houses were built on the earth and Cain built a city and called its name after the name of his son Enoch. And Adam knew his wife Eve and she bare yet nine sons. And in the fifth week of the fifth jubilee, Seth took Azurah, his sister, to be his wife. And in the fourth, she bare him Anos. And he began to call on the name of the Lord on the earth. And in the seventh jubilee and the third week, Anos took Noam, his sister, to be his wife, and she bare him a son in the third year of the fourth week, and he called his name Kenan. Now I do have to apologize. We're going to get into some complicated names here in the family tree. So I do apologize if I get some of these names wrong. Again, I don't speak Hebrew and these names are not names I'm familiar with as a lot of this, a lot of it has been taken out of the Bible. Some of it is still there, but a lot of it has, has been removed. And at the close of the eighth Jubilee, Kenan took Meleliath, his sister, to be his wife, and she bare him a son in the ninth Jubilee in the first week in the third year of his third week, and he called his name Mahaaliel. And in the second week of the tenth Jubilee, Mahaaliel took him unto his wife Dina, the daughter of Barakiel, the daughter of his first brother, and she bare him a son in the third week in the sixth year, and called his name Jared. For in his days the angels of the Lord descended on the earth, those who were named the watchers, that they should instruct the children of men, and that they should do judgment and uprightness on the earth. Okay, so now we're getting into Jared. This Jared is going to be the father of Enoch, as in the book of Enoch. And again, now we see the watchers coming to earth, these angel-type beings that are going to come and now teach human beings how to be human beings. We talked about this many, many, many months ago on the Dark Outpost when we were preparing for the Giants episodes, which the Giants were the Nephilim spoken about in the book of Enoch, which we're also going to get into in the book of Jubilee. And they taught the human beings things like alchemy, how to work with plant medicine, all sorts of stuff to help us on this earth, knowledge we needed in order to survive in this environment. Okay, so it's in Jared's generation that the Watchers are now sent to Earth. Chapter 16, and in the 11th Jubilee, Jared took himself a wife, and her name was Baraka, the daughter of Rashajujal, the daughter of his father's brother. In the fourth week of this Jubilee, she bare him a son. And in the fifth week, in the fourth year of the Jubilee, he called his name Enoch. So here's the second Enoch. Verse 17, and he was the first among men that bore on earth who learnt writing and knowledge and wisdom. So this is the second Enoch, who now is the first human being who is actually getting somewhat of an education. And who wrote down the signs of the heavens according to the order of their months in a book, that men might know seasons of years according to the order of their separate months. And he was the first to write a testimony, and he testified to the sons of men among the generations of the earth, and recounted the weeks of the jubilees, and made known to them the days of the years, and set in order the months, and recounted the Sabbaths of the year as we made them known to him. And once again, as we talked about in part one, a jubilee is a timeline, a time period. It is seven, the number seven, so seven years, seven days. The Sabbath is the seventh day or the jubilee of a week or 49 years. And so this is how they're keeping time is by this idea of jubilees. Verse 19, in what was and what will be he saw in a vision of his sleep as it will happen to the children of men throughout their generations until the day of judgment. He saw and understood everything and wrote his testimony and placed the testimony on earth for all the children of men and for their generations. And in the 12th Jubilee in the seventh week thereof, he took himself a wife and her name was Adin, the daughter of Danel, the daughter of his father's brother. And in the sixth year, in the week she bare him a son and he called him Methuselah. And he was moreover with the angels of God, the six jubilees of the year, and they showed him everything which is on the earth and in the heavens, 
the rule of the sun and he wrote down everything and he testified to the watchers who had sinned with the daughters of men for these had begun to unite themselves so as to be defiled with the daughters of men and enoch testified against them all so this is again getting us into this idea of the nephilim or these bloodlines which are both the watchers angels some people do believe this means extraterrestrial I don't really have an opinion on that because all of this is also very new to me because I did not grow up with this in the church. Even though the Bible does reference this a lot, it seems to be pretty much ignored by the church today, which I believe there's a reason for that. There's a lot of power there that they're not telling us about that we need to know. But obviously the Canaanites, the, the deep state, the cabal today know all of this stuff, right? So let's move on to verse 23. And he was taken amongst the children of men, and we conducted him into the Garden of Eden in majesty and honor. And behold, there he writeth down the condemnation and the judgment of the world and all the wickedness of the children of men. And on account of it, God brought the waters of the flood upon all of the land of Eden. And there he was set a sign that he should testify against all the children of men. And he should recount all the deeds of the generations until the day of condemnation. And if you guys remember from Sethian theology, it was not the God of Abraham, our God, that sent the flood. It was Yeldabaoth or Satan, the devil. And God, our God, told Noah to build the ark to save himself, okay? Um, I don't have an opinion on that. That's just part of Sethian theology, so please do not say anything mean in the comments because we're talking about this. Again, this is just part of the Sethian theology. I am just the messenger of this information. It is up to you what you believe. Verse 25, and he burnt the incense of the sanctuary, even sweet spices, before the Lord on the mount. For the Lord hath four places on the earth, the Garden of Eden, the Mount of the East, and the Mount on which thou art this day, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, which will be sanctified in the new creation for a sanctification of the earth. Through it will be the earth to be sanctified from all its guilt and its uncleanliness throughout the generations of the world. And once again, remember from part one that Moses is on Mount Sinai. This is the whole part of the beginning of the Bible where he's getting the Ten Commandments. But this is a more in-depth conversation that Moses is having with God on the mountain while also getting the Ten Commandments. And in the 14th Jubilee, Methuselah took unto himself a wife, Edna, the daughter of Azrael, the daughter of his father's brother in the third week. And in the first year of this week, he begot a son and called his name Lamech. And in the 15th Jubilee in the third week, Lamech took himself a wife and her name was Betanos, the daughter of Barakiel, the daughter of his bro father's brother. And in this week, she bare him a son and called his name Noah, saying, this one will comfort me for thy trouble and all my work and for the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And in the close of the 19th Jubilee, in the seventh week, in the sixth year, thereof Adam died, and all his sons buried him in the land of his creation, and he was the first to be buried in the earth. Now, interesting information about burying Adam. We know he's not the first human to die. The first human to die was Abel. And in this book, we're seeing that he was the first to be buried. And I know different parts of the Bible might say different things, but there is a theory that after Cain killed Abel, he actually ate him, which is where we get the word cannibal. Cain ate Abel, cannibal. And we know that's very much a part of the um, Luciferian or Canaanite cult, death cult today. So just an interesting side note that here in the book of Jubilee, we're actually seeing that Adam was the first person to be buried. He was not the first person to die, but the first person to be buried. So moving on to verse 30 of chapter 4. And he lacked 70 years of 1,000 years, for 1,000 years are as one day in the testimony of the heavens. And therefore it was written concerning the, three, the tree of knowledge, on the day that ye eat thereof, ye will die. For this reason he did not complete the years of this day, and he died during it. 
At this close of Jubilee, Cain was killed after him in the same year, for his house fell upon him, and he died in the midst of his house. And he was killed by its stones, for with a stone he had killed Abel, and by a stone he was killed in righteous judgment. That, my friends, is karma. Verse 32, for this reason it was ordained on the heavenly tables with the instrument that which a man killeth his neighbor with the same shall he be killed. For the manner that he wounded him in the like manner shall they deal with him. Sounds a little bit like capital punishment, right? And in the 20th, 5th Jubilee, Noah took to himself a wife. And her name was Emzara, the daughter of Rachiel, the daughter of his father's brother. In the first year, in the fifth week, and in the third year thereof, she bare him Shem. And in the fifth year thereof, she bare him Ham. And in the first year, in the sixth week, she bare him Jepheth. And that concludes chapter four. We will now be moving on to chapter five. Chapter five of the book of Jubilee. And it came to pass when children of men began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born unto them and the angels of God saw them on a certain year of this Jubilee that they were beautiful to look upon and they took themselves wives of all whom they chose and they bare unto them sons and they were giants and lawlessness increased on the earth and all flesh corrupted its way alike men and cattle and beast and birds and everything that walketh on the earth all of them corrupted their ways and in their orders, and they began to devour each other. Now, interestingly enough, in one of the commentaries I listened to on this, you're going to hear it mentioned a few times in this chapter, chapter 5, about them being corrupted in their ways. And there is one scholar that believes that this means that they were genetically altered. We're seeing that again today in our world, but this is what a lot of scholars believed it means to be corrupted in their ways and their orders, that their genetics were altered. Of course, if a human being is mating with an angel or an extraterrestrial, whatever it is that you believe the Watchers were, in my opinion, maybe they were a bit of both because I do think God created extraterrestrials as well. If our species are different, it's going to create a modified, a genetically modified being, whether that be an animal or a human. On this channel, we've talked a lot about the RH negative bloodline, which is my bloodline, where it's only 15% of the world that has or lacks, actually lacks the rhesus factor in their blood, including myself. And a lot of people believe that that is the bloodline of the watchers and men. I don't know, but it's just interesting. All of them corrupted their ways and their orders, and they began to devour each other, and lawlessness increased on the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of all men was thus evil continually. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. And all flesh had corrupted its orders, and all that were upon the earth had wrought all manner of evil before his eyes." And he said, I shall destroy man and all flesh upon the face of the earth, which I have created. But Noah found grace before the eyes of the Lord. Now again, back to Sethian theology, it was believed that it was Yeldabaoth who wanted to destroy man and, and destroy all the flesh upon the earth. And again, the Sethian theology says that Yeldabaoth actually created our nature, and God was the one that intervened and stepped in and gave us divine consciousness and spirit. Again, that's the Sethian theology. Do not shoot the messenger. Be kind in the comments. You can believe whatever you want to believe. This is us just exploring these different ideas. And you can know something about theology and philosophy and still not necessarily believe it. But it doesn't hurt to know what it is. So moving on to verse 6 and against the angels whom he had sent upon the earth he was exceedingly wroth and he gave commandments to root them out of all their dominion and he bade us to bind them in the depths of the earth and behold they were bound in the midst of them and they are kept separate and against their sons went forth a command from before his face that they should be smitten with the sword and be removed from under the heaven and he said thy spirit will not always abide on man, for they also are flesh, and their days shall be one hundred and twenty years. 
And he sent his sword into the midst that each should slay his neighbor. And they began to slay each other till they all fell by the sword and were destroyed from the earth. And their fathers were witness to their destruction. And after this, they were bound in the depths of the earth forever until the day of great condemnation, when judgment is executed on all those who have corrupted their ways and their works before the Lord. So this is talking about the Nephilim, these giants that were created by the watchers and man. Now, if you go back to the Bible and look at other verses in the Bible, like Genesis chapter six, where it also talks about the Nephilim. And we did a really big deep dive on the giants on the dark outpost, as well as on my channel, Esoteric Atlanta. It does allude in the Bible that there were also giants on the earth before the watchers came down. And in my opinion, the giants themselves are kind of like human beings in the sense that they also have free will. You know, each person has the propensity for both good and evil, and you have to actively make sure that you're on the path of service to others versus service to self. Now with the Nephilim, with the giants, in my own research, I found a lot of military information where there were allegedly giants in stasis that were chained up and still being kept to this day and someone that i know who's in or grew up in this death cult confirmed that the cabal does have some giants still chained up in certain areas of the world which is really really interesting and um i know if you if you're a reader of wikileaks there was an email with hillary clinton regarding the discovery of gilgamesh so that's interesting very very interesting and and in the book of jubilees it's saying that they were chained up and put away until the end in time the judgment day which i believe we're in the end times right now and again my belief in the end times is not that the world is actually going to end it's that we're going to move and shift into the age of aquarius or shift into a more positive thousand years of peace um, with god really in control and evil completely booted from from our world so we're going to move on to verse 11. And he destroyed all from their places, and there was no one left of them who he judged, not according to their wickedness. And he made for all his works a new and righteous nature, so that they should not sin in their whole nature forever, but should be all righteous in his kind always. And verse 12 here, um, another scholar mentions that this, so I'll read that again, that he made for all his works a new and righteous nature so that they should not sin in their whole nature forever, but should be righteous in his kind always, is basically saying that all of a sudden man, animal, these different species of living beings created by God. And remember in the book of the Holy 12, Jesus tells the disciples over and over and over again that the animals are brothers and sisters, that they were created and loved by God just as humans are. Well, right here it looks like it's saying that God has given us this desire to not crossbreed, like to not want to breed with another species, which we know that the cabal does that a lot. They, they mess with this stuff a lot, but that this was not supposed to happen. Okay. Verse 13, and the judgment of all is ordained and written on heavenly tables in righteousness, even the judgment of all who depart from the path, which is ordained for them to walk in. And if they walk not there in judgment is written down for every creature and for every kind. And there is nothing in heaven or on earth or in light or in darkness or in Sheol or in the depths or in the place of darkness, which is not judged and all their judgments ordained and written and engraved. In regard to all he will judge, the great accordance of his greatness and the small accordance of his smallness, and each accordance to his way. And he is not one who will regard the person of any, nor is he one who will receive gift. If he saith that he will execute judgment on each, if one gave everything that is on the earth, he will not regard the gifts of the person or any, nor accept anything at his hands, for he is a righteous judge. So basically, you can't bribe God. You can bribe Satan, but you can't bribe God. Verse 17, And the children of Israel as hath been written and ordained. If they turn to him in righteousness, he will forgive all their transgressions and pardon all their sins. It is written and ordained that he will show mercy to all who turn from all their guilt once a year. And as for all those who corrupted their ways and their thoughts before the flood, 
No man's person was accepted save of Noah alone, for his person was accepted in behalf of his sons, whom God saved from the waters of the flood on his account, for his heart was righteous in all his ways, according as it was commanded regarding him, and he had not departed from taught aught that was ordained for him. And the Lord said he would destroy everything which upon the earth, both men and cattle and beasts and fowls of the air and that which moveth on the earth. And he commanded Noah to make him an ark that he might save himself from the waters of the flood. And Noah made the ark in all respect as he commanded him. In the 27th Jubilee of years in the fifth week in the fifth year on the new moon of the first month. As he entered in the sixth year thereof in the second month, on the new moon of the second month, till the sixteenth, and he entered, and all that we brought to him into the ark, and the Lord closed it from without on the seventeenth evening. And the Lord opened seven floodgates of heaven, and the mouths of the fountains of the great deep seven months in, in number. And the floodgates began to pour down water from the heaven forty days and forty nights, and the fountains of the deep also sent up waters until the whole world was full of water. And the waters increased upon the earth. Fifteen cubits did the water rise above the high mountains, and the ark was lifted up above the earth, and it moved upon the faces of the waters. And the waters prevailed on the face of the earth five months, one hundred and fifty days. And the ark went and rested on the top of Labar on one of the mountains of Ararat. And on the new moon in the fourth month, the fountains of the great deep were closed and the floodgates of heaven were restrained. And on the new moon of the seventh month, all the months of the abyss of the earth were opened and the water began to descend into the deep below. And on the new moon of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains were seen. And on the new moon of the first month, the earth became visible and the waters disappeared from above the earth in the fifth week in the seventh year thereof, and on the seventeenth day in the second month the earth was dry. So interesting, God like closed the ark on the seventeenth day, and then the seventeenth day it was dry. It's kind of an homage to our favorite number now, number seventeen. And on the twenty-seventh thereof he opened the ark and sent forth from it beasts and cattle and birds and everything moving. And that concludes chapter five. Now we are going to move on to chapter Six. So this brings us into chapter six, which is the last chapter that we're going to read today. This chapter is going to be opening us up into, into some of the more juicy or spicy chapters of this book that I personally am looking forward to reading because for some reason, and I think I know the reasons, the church as a corporation has pretty much forgotten about these stories from the original Bible that the original Christians knew. We see reference to this in the New Testament where different apostles mention things about the giants or indeed the eating of flesh and the consumption of blood. Of course, if you've been following along on the Dark Outpost, this was a huge topic discussed in the book of the Holy Twelve. In almost every chapter in the book of the Holy Twelve, Jesus is constantly telling people, do not eat meat, do not beat animals, they are your brothers and your sisters, you need to take care of them. And we're going to start to see a little bit of that in chapter 6, and of course I do believe as we go further into Jubilees, we'll see more commandments on this issue. So here we go into chapter 6. And on the new moon of the third month, he went forth from the ark and built an altar on that mountain. And he made an atonement for the earth and took a kid and made atonement by its blood for all the guilt of the earth, for everything that had been on it and had been destroyed, save those that were in the ark with Noah. And when kid is written here, it's referring to um, goats, the young of a goat, not a actual child, human child even though it's very sad to sacrifice animals as well. And Jesus tells us not to do that in the book of the Holy Twelve, too. Comes back and says, wait, 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 wait let's, let's not do that anymore, right? Let's not offer animal sacrifices or any sacrifice anymore. 
So going on to verse three, and he placed the fat thereof on the altar, and he took an ox and a goat and a sheep and kids and salt and a turtle dove and the young of a dove and placed a burnt sacrifice on the altar and poured therein an offering mingled with oil and sprinkled wine and strewed frankincense over everything and caused a goodly savor to arise acceptable before the Lord. And the Lord smelt the goodly savor, and he made a covenant with him that there should not be any more flood to destroy the earth that all the days of the earth seed time and harvest should never cease cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night should not change their order nor cease forever and you increase ye and multiply upon the earth and became many upon it and be a blessing upon it the fear of you and the dread of you i shall inspire in everything that is on the earth and in the sea and behold, I give unto you all beasts and all winged things and everything that moveth on the earth and the fish in the waters and all things for food as the green herbs I have given you all things to eat. But flesh with the life thereof, with the blood ye shall not eat. For the life of all flesh is in the blood, least your blood of your lives be required. At the hand of every man, at the hand of every beast, I shall require the blood of man. Now it's interesting, I listened to another commentary channel say that this is basically saying that, that the blood needs to be removed from the flesh in order to eat the meat, but that's not what I get from this at all. And I think this is because of our background study in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. Now again, I am a vegetarian, but I have been a vegetarian for a very long time, and these banned Gospels were not the reason why I became a vegetarian. My backstory in vegetarianism is that as a child, I had a really hard time digesting meat. And so I just simply stopped eating it because it would hurt my stomach. Um, and then as I got older and got deeper into yoga, um, I did start to develop a lot of empathy for the animals and compassion for the animals. And it did become a, a moral thing for me at that point. But in the beginning, it was literally because I just had a really hard time digesting meat. And so I just stopped eating it. Now what I see here in verse 6 is that they're, they're reiterating that the green herbs of the earth are for the living beings that have blood in them. So we know that plants, we know that the trees, the grass is also alive. We know that when a tree dies in your front yard, it costs a lot of money to have it removed. So we know that things like plants die as well. However, the plants don't have blood. Our blood is very, very, very sacred. And I feel like it is starting to allude to that here in this part of Jubilee, that our blood holds our DNA coding. Um, again, I spoke about that in chapter five with the RH negative bloodline. I personally, in my opinion, believe that all the different blood groups signify a, a certain special quality about each person. Obviously, I don't believe in this idea that we came from monkeys. I think that's bullshit. I actually think we're way more complicated than, than that. Our existence is more complicated than that. And I think that part of the story of evolution was trying to distract us from the fact that these blood groups tell a different story. So when we get to verse 7, But the flesh with the life thereof, with the blood ye shall not eat, for the life of all flesh is in the blood. Least your blood of your lives be required. At the hand of every man, at the hand of every beast, shall I require the blood of man. I believe that this is God saying, do not eat the animals. Don't do it. Again, Jesus said that in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. If you all remember in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, part of the reason why Jesus was, was executed wasn't just because of blasphemy. It's because he refused to sacrifice a lamb at Passover. And that apparently was allegedly part of the laws of Moses. But he, he said, I am the lamb that will be sacrificed. Stop, stop this. Stop sacrificing animals. Their blood will not pay for your sins. And by sacrificing an animal, you are causing more sin for yourself. So that's what I'm getting from this. And again, that's just because of our background studies on the Gospels of the Holy Twelve. So we go on to verse 8. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed, for the image of God made he man. And you increase ye and multiply on the earth. 
and Noah and his sons swore that they, they would not eat any blood that was in any flesh. And he made a covenant before the Lord God forever throughout all the generations of the earth in this month. On this account, he spake to thee that thou should makest a covenant with the children of Israel in this month upon the mountain with an oath that thou should sprinkle blood upon because of all the words of the covenant which the Lord made with them forever. So in this, we also have to remember that this is a conversation God is having with Moses. So we're going to see the conversation go back and forth between the past and the present. And the present is on Mount Sinai with Moses again as he gets the Ten Commandments. So as we go through this book, just be aware of that, that we're going to start kind of going back and forth between the past and the present. Verse 12, and this testimony is written concerning you that you should observe it continually so that you should not eat on any day any blood of beast or birds or cattle during all the days of the earth. And the man who eateth the blood of beast or of cattle or of birds during all the days of the earth, he and he, his seed shall be rooted out of the land. Interesting to note as well, as we know on this channel and on David's channel, blood is obviously very important to the um the dark hats, the black hats, the cabal, they do a lot with blood. I think you guys know what I'm talking about. So it's interesting that this has obviously been knowledge that has been around since the beginning. And we were just, that, that knowledge was just kind of taken from us. Verse 13, And do thou command the children of Israel to eat no blood, so that their names and their seed may be before the Lord our God continually. For this law there is no limit of days, for it is forever. They shall observe it throughout their generations so that they may continue supplicating on your behalf with blood before the altar. Every day at the time of morning and evening, they shall seek forgiveness on your behalf perpetually before the Lord. That they may keep it and not be rooted out. And he gave to Noah and his sons a sign that there should not again be a flood on the earth. And he set his bow in the cloud for a sign of the eternal covenant that there should not again be a flood on the earth to destroy it all the days of the earth. So again, the rainbow, the bow is, is the rainbow. For this reason, it is ordained and written on the heavenly tables that they should celebrate for the feast of weeks in this month once a year to renew the covenant of the year. And this whole festival was celebrated in heaven from the day of creation till the days of Noah, 26 jubilees and five weeks of years. And Noah and his sons observed it for seven jubilees and one week of years till the day of Noah's death. And from that day of Noah's death, his sons did away with it until the days of Abraham and they ate blood. But Abraham observed it, and Isaac and Jacob and his children observed it up to thy days. And in thy days, the children of Israel forgot it until they celebrated anew on this mountain. So again, the eating of meat keeps sneaking its way back in. They keep forgetting that it's a law for them not to eat meat. We're also going to get into the calendar, which is really fascinating because we have no idea what our real year is. Absolutely no idea. And I heard a um, another commentator talk about how a lot of the churches believe we're in the 6,000s. Now, for me personally, this is just my personal opinion. I do believe that Atlantis did exist. And I have a theory, it's just my theory, that Atlantis was here before the Garden of Eden and Adam was created. I don't know if the people who lived in Atlantis looked like us. They might have looked differently than us. They might have been humanoid, but not looked human, if that makes sense. They might have been more what we would consider extraterrestrials looking like. And we know that Atlantis was incinerated, that something happened and Atlantis disappeared. And then I believe the new timeline that was created was the Adam story. So with that being said, I do believe that the, the timeline we're on now is about 6,000 years. However, I believe the Earth itself is a lot older because of other timelines that have been in existence on this plane of reality, if that makes sense. And again, that's just my opinion. Now we're going to see that if, if this is a 6,000 year time period, then the 7,000th year which is a jubilee year, is when the Savior, the Messiah, will come back and reign for a thousand years of peace, which I believe is the age of Aquarius. 
Now, I know a lot of Christians have a really hard time with astrology, and I can understand that because we have been heavily indoctrinated in the churches to believe that astrology is bad. In my opinion, the church, for the most part, is bad. This is just my own research. Doesn't mean that individual preachers are bad. A lot of people are just regurgitating what they've been taught over the years. So it creates a snowball effect or a domino effect of false information being spread to maintain a narrative because knowledge is power. These Canaanites that have ruled our, our earth for the past 6,000 years don't want us to know the truth. They don't want us to know who we really are because they serve Yeldabaoth, they serve Satan, they serve Lucifer. And they're trying direct to direct this planet into a negatively based place that feeds into Lucifer. And in order to do that, they have to brainwash us. They have to change the Christian faith. I do believe a lot of us are starting to figure that out now, that maybe we're better off just doing our own Bible study because there's a lot that has been altered in the canonized Bible and obviously a lot of stuff was taken out and we're just now starting to realize that. Apocalypse means to lift the veil, to see clearly, to, to reveal things, the revelation, things are revealed. And so with the years, with the astrology, you're going to see a lot of references to following moon cycles. Um, when I'm in India, we follow a moon cycle. Women, your cycles, your actual female cycles typically fall either around new moon or full moon. And we're going to see that here in this chapter that he is going to, God talking to Moses as in he, capital H-E, is going to start to explain that, the way that time should really be calculated. I believe that they have messed with time so that we wouldn't know these things. And we're going to get into that into this chapter that we're not going to know when real festivals are. We know that like Christmas, for example, is not Jesus's birthday. Actually, Christmas is a Saturnalian festival that's pretty satanic. Jesus, it is believed, was possibly born on the 11th of September. So that is gives a little bit more backstory as to why that day was such an important day to create a mourning, not a celebration, but a mourning, right? And so we're going to start to see that now. At this point, nobody has a clue what our actual year is. So let's go on to verse 20. And do thou command the children of Israel to observe this festival in all their generations for a commandment unto them one day in the year, in this month, they shall, they shall celebrate the festival. For it is the feast of weeks and the feast of first fruits. This feast is twofold and double in nature, according to what is written and engraved concerning it, celebrate it. Verse 22, for I have written in the book of the first law and that which I have written for thee that thou shouldest celebrate it in its season one day in the year and I explained to thee its sacrifices that the children of Israel should remember and should celebrate it throughout their generations in this year one day in every year. And on the new moon of the first month, and on the new moon of the fourth month, and on the new moon of the seventh month, and on the new moon of the tenth month are the days of remembrance, and the days of the seasons, and the four divisions of the year. These are written and ordained as a testimony forever. And Noah ordained them for himself as feasts for the generations forever, so that they have become thereby a memorial unto him. And on the new moon of the first month, he was bidden to make for himself an ark. And on that day, the earth became dry, and he opened the ark and saw the earth. And on the new moon of the fourth month, the mouths of the depths of the abyss beneath were closed. And on the new moon of the seventh month, all the mouths of the abysses of the earth were opened, and the water began to descend into them. And on the new moon of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains were seen, and Noah was glad. And on this account, he ordained them for himself as feast for a memorial forever, and thus they are ordained. And they placed them on the heavenly tables. Each had thirteen weeks from one to another past their memorial, from the first to the second, and from the second to the third, and from the third to the fourth. 
and all the days of the commandment will be two and fifty weeks of days, and these will make the entire year complete. Thus it is engraved and ordained to the heavenly tables, and there is no neglecting the commandment for a single year or from year to year. And command thou the children of Israel that they observe the years according to this reckoning three hundred and sixty-four days, and these will constitute a complete year, and they will not disturb its time from its day and from its feast, for everything will fall out in them according to their testimony, and they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feast. And if they do neglect and do not observe them according to his commandment, then they will disturb all their seasons, and the years will be dislodged from this order, and they will disturb the seasons, and the years will be dislodged, and they will neglect their ordinances." And the children of Israel will forget and will not find the path of the years and will forget the new moons and seasons and Sabbaths and they will go wrong to all the orders of the year. So again, they're going to lose track of what the actual timeline really is, which we absolutely have. For I know and from henceforth shall I declare unto thee, and it is not of my own devising. For the book written before me and on the heavenly tables the division of the days is ordained. Least they forget the feast of the covenant and walk around according to the festivals of the Gentiles after their error and after their ignorances. So yes, we are celebrating holidays around Gentile uh, celebrations, as I just said, Christmas is a Saturnalian festival which was practiced in the Roman Empire. So, definitely true. We have definitely fallen to the Gentile celebrations, which is Canaanite. Verse 36, For there will be those who will assuredly make observations of the moon. Now it disturbeth the seasons, and cometh in from year to year, ten days too soon. For this reason the years will come up upon them, and they will disturb the order, and make an abomination day the day of testimony. Interesting, right? Sunday is the day we worship in churches, and that's actually Horace's day. It, Constantine, who Constantine, again, was absolutely 100% not a saint or a Christian, even though they want you to believe he is, it's because he was a Canaanite, along with the leaders of the church were Canaanites, not Christians. And they moved the Sabbath to Sunday, which is Horus's day, so the abominable day of testimony, and an unclean day, a feast day, and they will confound all these days, the holy with the unclean, and the unclean day with the holy, for they will go wrong as to the months, and the Sabbaths, and the feasts, and the jubilees. For this reason I command and testify to thee that thou mayest testify to them. For after thy death thy children will disturb them, so that they will not make the year 364 days only, and for this reason they will go wrong as to the new moons and seasons and Sabbaths and festivals, and they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh. And that ends chapter 6. Next week we will just pick up again with chapter 7. And we're really going to start to get in some interesting stuff. So I hope that you enjoyed that. I hope you're enjoying the series that we're doing. Again, if you want more commentary and want to hear more of a discussion on these banned gospels than I give you on my channel on Wednesdays, then please follow the link in the description box below to the Dark Outpost TV and join us there. I hope you guys are all having a wonderful week so far. If you would like to purchase our opening song, there is a link in the description box below. And thank you again to Todd Rodberg for helping me get this out to you guys. I hope you guys have a wonderful day, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.